Um, brilliant. Um, so yeah, so I'm Mike Off. I work at the University of Bristol, um, and I'm going to be talking to you today about the automated conversion of Excel cost effectiveness models to R based cost effectiveness models. So I'm basically going to be doing exactly what's in this XKCD. I'm going to show you lots of slides that don't look like they link together at all, and then right at the end I'll surprise you and go, actually they do. Um, so please bear with me, parts of it are horribly technical, mm -hmm. and um, I won't be offended if you fall asleep. Um, so just as a quick summary, this is not an exhaustive list, but generally speaking we can sort of say the previous uh, improvements to sort of the, the HTA ethos uh, focuses on either helping people who are already using Excel or shaking a carrot in front of them and going, ah, but we have these other packages you could use. And this sort of seems like the, the, the general gist of, of it. We, we, we try to convince them that you know, Excel is slow, we try to convince them that R is fast. We sit here and go, we can do VOI, uh, we can take advantage of high performance computing techniques, uh, we can make things faster for you in here. I'm thinking mostly of the Canadian HTA, which you have to do it in one day. Um, and you know, R is free. I know that may not sound like a, re uh, a thing you think about, but Excel is actually a proprietary software. How many people do you see submitting one in Google Sheets? <laughs> like, yes, the format is open, but do you see it? However, uh, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that every time we uh, try to create a new standard, we just add the number of standards by one, um, and then it, it just becomes a nightmare. Um, and so the biggest problem we've got at the moment is that you do need to learn how to program. And that is not a low barrier to entry. Um, at the moment, it will require a much stronger mathematical knowledge for some of the things you're trying to do than what you necessarily need in Excel, and many in industry would just not be familiar at all. So the advantages of automated conversion are supposedly that in the long run, it will be faster. What usually happens when people do this is it spirals into an absolute mess. However, there are additional advantages that you may not consider. You may have an old model that you have to somehow validate for some reason. This allows you to do it without actually having to worry about the fact you've shifted everything to R. Uh, it pre prevents the loss of reproducibility. So there may be a model from 20 years ago, which you can still run today on Excel because Excel guarantees you that backwards compatibility. And this sort of will help you with that. There also are a couple of other advantages which we're going to sort of lean on in this. So the big one we're going to lean on is faster PSA calculations. Um, it allows people who are familiar with Excel to continue using it. And this is a, another big one for those who just can't learn the language. You know, thinking here, clinicians, HTA bodies, they are too busy to set aside the time to do it. This will help those sorts of groups. So um, this is actually the motto almost, move fast and break things. Uh, luckily, I have not had any of these other jobs. Um, <laughs> however, before we get onto that, there is one caveat. I, will, I always get asked, can ChatGPT do this? And the, so the short answer is no. The long answer is ChatGPT is a large language model, which means that it's very good at pretending it knows what it knows. Now, what that sort of means is, depending on which version of ChatGPT you're using, and I did try 4 recently, um, or 4.0, oh, whatever they call it, is that it will give you a very confident answer that is completely and utterly wrong. And even the latest versions are like this. However, that's not to say you can't utilize this to some extent. GitHub Copilot is the co-programming based one. Although Microsoft has currently got a million lawsuits because they scraped half the internet for their code and then claimed it was open source and not copyright or anything like that. Um, and then in general, machine learning, great for analysis, difficult for code conversion. So. How do we do this? Well, it really is all down to the grammar, if you believe the computer scientists. Um, this is the grammar. It's horrid. It's 25 pages long. It doesn't actually follow the standard that it claims it follows, which means it's almost impossible to actually get something to read it properly. Um, but in theory, you can convert Excel into any language, 
as long as it can interpret this grammar. So we know there is a comp, uh, comp sci basis for us doing this. However, I decided I don't like grammars. Instead, we're going to use an abstract syntax tree. So you can imagine this as a way of walking through the program and creating a diagram of how am I actually going to execute my code. And so if you imagine this relatively simple uh, while loop, all it's going to do is it's going to start at the top, it will create a node, there will be a decision, so you'll have a branching. As you move down, there is another decision, so there's an if statement, the way it's comparing variables, there is another branch where you've got the else, so on and so forth. This is a very sort of uh, building blocks way of, of discussing any uh, language. Um, and we can use it in this case to uh, allow the conversion process to happen. So here is an example for Excel. So at the top left is the equation we're going to be converting. Um, and underneath it is what the abstract syntax tree actually looks like in terms of if I just printed it to the screen. It's pretty boring. It's not useful to you. Um, but hey, uh, this, is, this is what it actually looks like. So the next thing we need to do is actually convert the entire uh, spreadsheet. So the broad stroke method is we just pick a cell. It doesn't really matter which cell. We see if there's something in it, and if there is, we create the abstract syntax tree. We then walk the tree, and when doing the walk, we then pick the bits of it that need to be written in R and do the conversion. And the bits of it that don't need to be written in R, like you know, a plus in Excel is the same as a plus in R. I don't need to do any changes there. Um, and then right at the end, we mash it all together, and we now we have a single line of code that represents what happens in one cell. As you can imagine, if you have a million cells, that's a million lines of code. Um, and also, the cells are picked from top left to bottom right. Excel does not read top left to bottom right in any way, shape, or form. So you're going to need to sort your code lines out later. You also have other problems. So a comma appears in every programming language, but how do you represent a comma when you don't want it to interfere with the language you're writing in? So you have to invent separate characters and pretend that they mean things. But overall, this is what it will look like in the back end, and hopefully you'll never, ever see this if you use this. If you do, you're insane. Because <laughs> it means you're looking for it. So after that, we sort of do the full code generation. We sort of say, OK, we need to stitch it all together. Now, if you imagine you've got lots of empty cells, well, they're just going to appear as NAs. We don't need NAs floating around everywhere. So you remove them. Uh, you can imagine that there will be things like titles, which get called once and do nothing in the R. means a lot in the Excel. We don't need that. We can get rid of it. Um, and so, in essence, we at some point during this process, we will have told Excel, this is what we care about. Not Excel, sorry, the converter, this is what we care about, and then discard everything else. Then this cull can sometimes take quite a while, um, but often it's not too bad. Now, if we assume this all works automatically, then in theory, all we then need to do is call the Reva library, which will handle any annoying changes between Excel and R. So for example, sum, the sum function in Excel does not work the same as the sum function in R, so you have to do a little bit of jiggery-pokery. Um, certain orders of um, uh, arguments may be reversed between Excel and R, so you've just got to sort of handle those problems. And then you can do things like hook into BCEA, you can hook into um, Shiny, uh, you can basically do anything in R that you would usually do in R um, with what is output. And uh, currently a colleague of mine, Jian, is working on trying to get VOI integrated to this. So this is an Excel spreadsheet. It is a very boring Excel spreadsheet. It is the simplest Excel decision tree you will probably ever see in your life. Um, and I'm going to claim to you that I can, in fact, convert this into R. Now, it, there are some key points I need to make about this. 
This Excel spreadsheet does not have a DSA, it's only a PSA. The VBA only handles the PSA, and it doesn't generate any graphs. So, can I do it? It turns out the answer is yes, and it looks pretty gross. Um, this line here caused me great fun. It turns out that in our studio there is a maximum line limit for, limit for the console of around 4,090-something characters. I found that one out the hard way. Um, it caused me hours of fun. But as you can see, there is a code output. Now, I'm going to claim to you that this does work. I'm going to claim it to you uh, later, uh, when I might show you, depends on if I put given them the correct presentation. Um, so I'm going to claim to you that this works, and that we have successfully handled everything, and right at the end, it will spit out some graphs. So, okay, let's be honest, decision tree, that's pretty trivial. How about a Markov model? So this is a two-state Markov model. It has both a PSA and a DSA. It does contain graphs. It does <coughs> contain VBA, although that VBA is, once again, just controlling the PSA and DSA outputs. So. Can I do the conversion? Well, yes, and it's even worse. So this is 400 lines of R. Um, I don't think many of you will have written 400 lines of R to do one of these, because why would you? You can probably do it in 50. Um, and so as you can see, this is not a very human readable format. It's not nice in that regard. But um, it does the job. However, there are some caveats. It does generate the graphs the same way as what we saw Previously, it gives us the correct uh, cost-effective displays and acceptability curves. However, you haven't got a DSA. Sorry, I, I just I can't do it. It's 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 a nightmare. Um, <laughs> but PSA, we can do it, and we can do it because when you think about how a PSA is done in Excel, all you have done is wrap the entire spreadsheet in a loop. You don't care about what's going on in the spreadsheet necessarily. It's just, you can think of it almost as you run the spreadsheet, you then close it, you then open it up again, you write down the result, you close it, you open it. If you're really sadistic, you could do that. <laughs> but we can take advantage of that and know that in R, well, if I'm generating a random number, I can generate a vector of random numbers. So I don't need to loop. I can just propagate a vector of 1, 10, 100, 1,000, a million random numbers through. I've not looped at all, which then comes to some interesting graphs. So the HIPS model is a teaching model we use at Bristol, and we have it written in both Excel and R. They both give the same answer, so we know they're the same. I'm faster than both. Now, this is, there's a couple of reasons why we think this happens, um, and the primary reason is that I've effectively used techniques that are um, similar to how a compiler works. So when a compiler is compiling C, for example, one of the sta stages it will do is it will look for for loops. If it knows the for loop has a maximum number, say 100, then you can imagine that it's going to replace the for loop with a copy and paste of 100 times of that text. And the reason it does that is because that's actually faster for the computer to handle because it can do optimizations to that than it is for it to run the loop process because the loop is expensive. R can't do that because it's an interpreted language. What we can do is fake the unrolling by using a vector. So by doing this vector of random numbers, we've effectively unrolled our loop. On top of that, as I learnt in this, we, we had a bit of an inkling of this, but we learnt in, I think it was Darren's talk, we avoided any matrix call. I don't use matrices anywhere in this. Which mean, and matrices, when we did a comparison in, um, between lists and matrices, just to access something in there, it was around five to 10 times difference in timings. Having seen the bit this morning saying there's also an order of magnitude in accessing and changing, I can fully believe that this could potentially be faster because the main, the actual R code did use matrix algebra. I can see that one. So how do we validate it? Well, <laughs> the current method is to just plug the same numbers into Excel and the same numbers into R and show that the number that comes out at the end is exactly the same. 
it's a very simple method. Um, it's just to prove that the maths actually follows the maths we're claiming it follows. Um, this does require the user to play with the Excel spreadsheet. This is something we'd like to change. Um, so we also would ideally like to uh, add things like unit testing. <laughs> um, the DSA. I say it may not be implemented. It might be, but you'll be getting a median rather than a mean DSA. Don't ask me why. Um, the full suite of Excel functions is not currently implemented. It, it takes a lot of time, but we are slowly progressing through it. We do actually have a GUI to make it work. Um, it is not following that previous discussion we had in our Shiny. Um, I really need to follow that. And well, as you can see, the R output is mm, readable is a definitely worth the quotation marks. So where do we go from here? Um, <coughs> it needs unit testing. It needs integration testing. But we do currently have a black box test. We know it works. We know the answer is correct. Open PyXL, the tokenizer is wrong. I found that out the hard way. We can't handle things like offset at the moment. But with a very simple fix, there it will be able to handle offset. We've already tested it. We know it works. So we just need to get that pushed into the next update of Open PyXL, which I think is 3.2. Obviously, add the rest of the Excel functions. Now, the other thing is we need to test a wider range of Excel models. We've been playing with a lot of academic star models at the moment. We've got a handful of a couple of consultancy models. There is a wide world out there. I cannot guarantee I will be able to handle every Excel model you throw at me, but I can certainly give it a shot. Um, some more VOI stuff, <laughs> and one that's not on here, but VBA at the moment is difficult to handle, but we are trying to do that because we appreciate custom functions and all that jazz. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's everything. Else. Shall we? Probably got quite a lot of questions on this one. So, who would like to go first? Oh, one right at the back. Right. Thanks, Michael. That was amazing. So, a few questions. Um, have you considered sending that messy output output to the large language model, which is very good at five years? So for the first question, if you oops, repeat so, question. so the first question was, um, can I thread this into a large language model to make it pretty? Um, I probably could. I haven't. <laughs> um, most of the reason I haven't is because most of this you probably wouldn't want to look at anyway. Um, and even if you did throw it in a large language model, there's no guarantee it would still be readable. Um, but maybe that's something we can definitely investigate. Uh, the second part of the question was, can we market this as a way of demonstrating if your Excel model is correct? Is that right? Well, it, it, it's actually a way of debugging your Excel model, I guess. If someone's made a mistake, it's going to throw the as well. So we've currently decided to run on the assumption that you have to provide us a perfect Excel model, because it's difficult for us to catch errors, especially if you think of it in terms of like a mathematical error. We would just calculate the exact same mathematical error. We would never know. If it's an error that appears flagged in Excel, we would hope that that gets seen because it has a big hash error or whatever type of error it is in the Excel book before it reaches us. Um, it would actually crash on those errors, which I guess you could market it as a way of it um, <laughs> not being able to handle the errors, but I wouldn't call that an elegant method of uh, testing. No. Okay, I'm hoping Rob's going to let me run over because I've got quite a few chat questions. Yeah. yeah. Right, cool. So we'll take one from Sven then. So um, questions from Sven. Firstly, for the PSA, how are you obtaining the uncertainty distribution? What assumptions do you make? So for the PSA, <laughs> when, we, when we looked at the models that we were using as reference models, the method of generating a PSA broadly, <coughs> broadly comes down to um, having a distribution that then has a RAND statement inside of it. The RAND statement is just a flat distribution. So what that allows us to do is replace every RAND statement in the Excel model with an equivalent statement in R from a flat distribution. 
and then just pass that value into the actual distribution we care about, which is why we can take advantage of the vector of random numbers, because if you imagine it in terms of the XL, if you're replacing rand with, um, well, you can't really replace rand with anything in the XL, it's just a single value. But if you now imagine you could put rand in there twice, and it would actually fill out two XL cells <laughs> for you, or rand in there three times, it would fill out three XL cells. It's so all we're doing in R is, the, is, is that process. So we're still following the same distribution methods as you use in Excel. We're just doing it slightly differently to actually pass the rand inside. And take the question yeah. there first. <laughs> just to concentrate on my two cells, so I will do it, obviously. And uh, what we would like to see in an R code, then we can make uh, an R program very short and nice by creating a model of a function. Mm -hmm. And then using the function in DSA, PSA, and everything else. Is that something that this package was already doing, or you're thinking about it? Or is it? So at the moment, it, it just does a raw conversion. A question for people on Oh, there. sorry, yes. Yeah, so okay. um, the question was will this program be able to create a function to perform these, con uh, like the PSA, that sort of stuff? Is that, is that Any right? Any calculation is to be presented as function. The main function is the model function. So represent the, the the main functions properly, I suppose, mm. would be the way to describe it. Yeah. Well, let's uh, use an <coughs> example of an Excel model with 20 comparators, and each comparator is a separate worksheet, but they're doing exactly the same thing with different uh, inputs. Right, so I see. So I would like to have, to have it as a simple function that does everything. And we, we did it manually, but I'm wondering the, uh, an automated conversion can in principle, and the future do better. So at the moment, it's a very dumb conversion. At the moment, it just will do the conversion, and if there are repeats, it will do the repeat. However, we can take examples from compilers where they will actually compare abstract syntax trees and will recognize when they are the same at which point they will replace it with a function equivalent in the mm. back end. So actually, you, if we took this to its, I guess, logical conclusion of compiling Excel into R, we could pre-calculate all the maths that's already done in the converter, but we could also do the conversion into a function, so you only call a matrix vector multiplication in a function once, but you may mm. call that function 10 times throughout the code. We haven't done that. We have spoken about it. But I, I'm not actually a computer scientist by background, and so I struggle <coughs> with some of these concepts, but I do know they exist, and it is possible. Um, I hope that answered your question. <laughs> okay, so uh, last two from online then. So from Sven, can it handle all of the complex things that we might have in Excel? So name ranges, name ranges containing formulas, ActiveX controls, form controls, spill functionality, that sort of thing? So <coughs> it can deal with named ranges. We have already <laughs> included that. Uh, dynamic ranges, as I've mentioned in the talk, are currently not handled, but they will be handled <laughs> once the OpenPyXL push is done. Um, as for drop downs and uh, the other Excel functionality, um, it's it's a, a toss-up as to whether or not we're going to include all of it. Mm -hmm. So, for example, on the, the newer Excel functions with the spilling, um, we haven't included any way of handling, um, I guess, it's the equivalent of a vector in a matrix, uh, uh, what they call it, they call them array operations in Excel. Um, we haven't handled that yet because they are much more difficult to handle. Mm. However, we do have a strategy where we could. So you can imagine using an array would naturally convert into a matrix, which does sort of throw away one of the big improvements we sort of said we can do. But hey, if it makes the Excel work, it works. However, for things like drop downs, currently most drop downs work by having an if statement buried in the cell. When that's the case, it will convert the if statement. However, if the drop down doesn't actually have any impact attached to it, then it won't be converted. And what I mean by that is if the drop down only affects VBA, I, I don't know what the VBA is doing. So um, yeah. I can't make mm. the conversion. OK, 
Okay, last one from online. Anywhere we can go and see the examples in the code, yeah? Sure, meet me in the pub. <laughs> 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 I've got my laptop on me. I would have, if, if, we, if I was using it for this, I could have actually given you a live demonstration, although that's yeah. always a dangerous game. But, well, we will soon. Yeah, we will soon, yes, definitely. There, this, this is, like, soon. <laughs> nice. Okay, cool. Well, I think we've got one more, if you've got time. Go on, one last one. Just going briefly back to the randomness thing. So the, the RAM formula in Excel, yep. I think based on my knowledge, I think it is actually a broken implementation of a Richmond Hill linear congruential generator. Before 2007, yes. Yeah, and is unseedable. <coughs> yes. So, whereas the VBA R&D function... Uh, is a different one, yes. Crystal, ...which is seedable. Yep. So I guess the question I come to is, so you, you say you can sub in a uniform distribution sample. Yep. No. So you can't reproduce a random. Sorry, uh, for the for the mic. Um, can we reproduce the AE randomness in Excel the same as the randomness in R um, based on seeds? The answer to that is maybe towards no. I say maybe because I've just had a thought of how we could do it. Um, I'm going to say no first of all because, as you say, the base rand function just is wrong um, most of the time. You can't seed it, so we'd have no idea how to even start making that the same. If you are using a seeded function through VBA, the answer is maybe, because if both R and Excel are using the exact same pseudo-random number generator and give them the same seed, they should give the same order, but that's a making a lot of assumptions between Excel and R. Um, that's why we've decided that the way to validate it is to you basically, we would say your probability will be 0.1. It will always be 0.1. It will cascade through. It will give you a fixed number. You go into Excel. You type in 0.1. That cascades through. It gives you a fixed number. It's a very dirty method of doing it, but it does guarantee that the results will or will not show that the same. All right. Thank you so much, Michael. <laughs> and then over to uh, Rob and Tom. Yeah.